Welcome to the first in a series for guiding council or core council values and members. This is specifically oriented towards choosing members for the core council. They need to have shared values, knowledge of the system, and how to influence it for improvement. It's the first in a series related to the five-part series on design teams. And I will apologize in advance, this one is longer than the typical. Similar to design team members, guiding core council members have to be agents of change. They're agents of influence in a less direct way, but they become skilled at transformation of both themselves and their work, and they help direct the improvement of the whole system. They do this by working across processes, by guiding and directing and coaching others who are working in design teams. Considerations for selecting guiding council members are that there are people who ought to be focused by systemic outcomes. They need to be influence agents and systems thinkers. They need to be experienced in managing processes. They need to be change agents who are frustrated by the status quo and people who understand the customer experience. They need to be cooperators, not competitors. They need to mo be more about we than me. And listeners and learners, innovators and early adopters are especially valued and they need to be trained in the science of improvement. They need to be people who are trustworthy and who trust others. It's especially critical that we realize that everybody coming to a guiding council may not be capable of all of these activities and behaviors at one time. It's a very rare selection. And sometimes guiding council members will come in and need to learn some of these key behaviors of influence. A quick review of this design team model is that the guiding or core council is chartered by the executive sponsors to lead system-wide initiatives. There are a number of values that need to be demonstrated by the core council in order to guide the effective implementation of improvements across the system. This list is not all-inclusive but it's a good place for any guiding council to begin to think about the values that they're going to put into action in their broad systemic initiative. Let's briefly recount the role of the council is to guide the design teams that are chartered to lead initiatives to improve processes, services, or products. This means that in addition to the core council, these teams need to understand how to use the science of improvement. They need to use the design team structures and methods that they're taught, and they design the improvements that they're chartered to design. A critical part of the work done by the guiding council is to use this influence model. We talk about this in a separate broadcast, but we wanna make sure that you understand the role of this guiding council is to focus and measure the work of all the design teams as well as their own work. To find what are the vital behaviors of teamwork and focusing on the processes, using continual quality improvement and spreading improvement to engage all six sources of influence that they should have at a personal, social, and structural level. The work of the Guiding Council is to be focused by system measures and outcomes. Members need to value and use the science of improvement. They need to understand the interaction of variation in the system they're trying to influence. And they need to appreciate the effect of the system on people, both customers, suppliers, and team members. And they need to ask open-ended questions like, how do we predict the impact on people? Guiding council members need to be systems thinkers and their behaviors in words and actions need to reflect that they are thinking broader than just the narrow functional focus. They need to understand the big picture and asking open-ended questions helps them. Examples might be to ask what's the aim of this system 
or what are we trying to accomplish? System thinkers use knowledge of the system to choose possible points of influence. They also need to be open to other perspectives of every issue and situation, and they need to always seek to understand the interdependencies between the components of the system and their interactions. A requirement for guiding council members is to be experienced at managing processes. This always comes from deep experience in broken processes. And members of a guiding council need to understand the responsibilities of management and leadership. People who are subject matter experts in frontline services don't always understand management and leadership as two separate things that are both essential. So this is nothing against subject matter expertise because they are also vital, but not on a guiding council. It's important that the members of the guiding council deliver measurable evidence of improvement. They need to be focused on results of processes or outcomes from processes. They also need to think about the systemic or balancing measures that ensure we're not suboptimizing the whole system by optimizing just a part. Council members also need to understand that processes deliver measurable outcomes, although some things are unknown and unknowable, and thus everything important is not measurable. Guiding council members need to be change agents. As we've talked about design team members needing to be change agents, there's a higher level of requirement for guiding council members. They need to see that scientific improvement requires theories tested by changes that come through the PDSA cycle. All improvement requires change, but not every change leads to improvement. The evidence of improvement is required, and that can only come from the science of improvement and the use of the PDSA cycle. Members of the guiding council need to be dissatisfied with the present system they need to be the exact opposite of complacent, and they need to be active advocates for a better future. They also need to be people who understand the customer experience. The primary focus of the guiding council is on the system's impact on the customer. They pay the price first. A secondary focus is on the impacts of the system and changes in the system on the team of employees, managers, even executives as customers and stakeholders in the system. They each have different needs to be served. And last, the other stakeholders in the system need to be considered as there are impacts on all the stakeholders in a system, even the communities in which you do business. As mentioned before, we need cooperators, not competitors. We need people who are willing to focus more on we than on me. We need to be directed by the aim and the purpose of the system. And guiding council members need to be disciplined in thinking in communications and methods. We use basic principles of team effectiveness, especially a focus on the situations or issues, not on the personalities in the system. We use the science of improvement to get the evidence we need that the changes we're making are actually improvements. It's really critical for guiding council members to learn to listen. They'll learn more by listening than by talking, and they need to ask open-ended questions and then listen for the answers. Silence can be a very useful tool to guiding council members. And we all know that learning comes from knowledge developed in PDSA cycles. Everything else is not scientific, it's not knowledge, it's taking somebody else's word for it. A critical and difficult part is unlearning some faulty notions. So this is why learners are very much appreciated as guiding council members. Also, we consider that innovators and early adopters are positive influencers of others. Together, they're going to be less than 15% of the people in the social system we're trying to improve. Improvements require diffusion across the system, and who better to help the spread than the guiding council and the innovators and early adopters in the system? 
Guiding council members also need to be trained in the science of improvement. They need to know how they know. This comes from learning continual quality improvement methods from people like Deming and Acoff. They need to understand design team methods are quite different than the usual team or committee or task force, or whatever you want to call it. Those methods are no longer appropriate for a modern business or enterprise. Design team methods can be learned from the work of Peter Schultes, Chris Argerus, and the spread methods that go with that come from people like Everett Rogers as well as Chris Argerus. This spreading of change and improvement is a really critical part of design team work and the guiding council members need to know it better in order to coach people on design teams in how to do that. Another area from the science of improvement is problem solving and decision making. People like Kaoru Ishikawa with the cause and effect diagram, Peter Schultes with his work in teamwork and leadership are critical people to understand their work in the science of improvement. And last but not least, systems thinking needs to be learned if it's not already present in members of the guiding council. Systems thinking can come from many sources. In particular, we refer to the work of Russell Acoff and De Bono. De Bono having some British perspective about how the human being brain works and how to think better about the problems we have to solve. Russell Acoff, very much a source from the 20th century on systems and systems thinking. Guiding council members need to be trustworthy and they need to be able to trust others. There's absolutely no teamwork possible without trust among members of any team. And trust is built over time from shared experiences. Trust can be destroyed in an instant. And we all should recognize that it takes a very long time to build trust because most organizations are filled with fear, especially those that do not perform well. Trust is essential to effective communications and communications is essential to integrate the efforts of guiding counsel, the desires of the executive sponsors, as well as the members of the design teams. As mentioned before, guiding counsels use a similar set of roles to design teams. It's important that all guiding council members are capable of leadership. They all need to be people who want to make a difference in their work for the benefit of their customers. And there are five distinct roles in a guiding council, communications, teamwork, supplier, process, and customer are five separate roles that every member should eventually practice and learn how to practice very well. As with any team, the team size of a guiding council is very important. We definitely need a minimum of five people to fill these critical roles. Five members are also the optimum team size. Extra members can become coaches to the team members who fill those five roles and can back up other members. However, I want to remind you that team performance suffers if there are more than seven regular members. Again, five is the optimum team size. But if you get too large, the negative impact will first be felt in logistics of meeting coordination and the greater impact comes with the impact on communication and trust. Absolutely vital if you're going to guide other teams, you have to be able to trust each other. So it's important to use a charter to start up the council, starting with an aim or vision and talk about this in detail as you create the charter for the team with the executive sponsors. You do need to set goals. You need to work through what are the roles and responsibilities of the members of the team who will fill those roles and identify the communications and interpersonal reactions and actions that are necessary to manage the work of a guiding council. 
And last, the team needs to focus on the defined team processes. They're going to be a little bit different than design teams. There's different responsibilities. So those additional tasks are going to be quite different because of that guiding and directing role taken by the guiding or core council. Thank you for your kind attention. This is the first in a series, a supplement to the design team modules. We'd like to thank you for your interest and any questions that you might have will be gladly received and answered as quickly as possible. You have my email below, you have my phone number, and I'd be delighted to talk to you. If I can't answer your call right away, please leave a message and I'll give you a call back right away if you leave your number. Thank you.